It is a great pleasure to be able to address you once again, and thank you for your consistent commitment to the agenda for reform and modernization in Europe. Europe is indeed a continent of explorers. We all have our stories of teamwork, bravery, and endurance in the face of huge challenges in search of the prize. Today, Europe itself is explorer. The prizes are more jobs, higher standard of living, delivered by economically and environmentally sustainable long-term growth. We all know the challenges. The financial and economic crisis has hit the European Union hard. The economic forecasts the commissions published last week are not as good as we all would have liked, and you already mentioned it, Anne. Our new macroeconomic analysis, part of uh, the toolkit for economic governance has shown there are persisting macroeconomic imbalances, and there is also increasing social unease in some of our communities. I think we also agree that the way to address our problems is beyond the necessary fiscal consolidation to boost growth. Growth is, of course, the answer. If we fail here, we risk wasting the talents of generation of young people and creating a long period of low productivity, a lasting debt burden, and ultimately weakening the social model of which Europeans are rightly proud. Not moving is not an option, nor is to try to reconstruct the sort of unsustainable growth of the time before the crisis. We will not come back to the time before the crisis. Major changes are taking place also all over the world. So we, what we have to do now is to use this situation to make the reforms long overdue, to recover some sustainable growth through increased competitiveness. Europe faces serious structural challenges, which can indeed only be addressed by moving ahead with a profound structural reform. A reform that, of course, builds on national efforts, but a reform that should also be truly European, that builds on Europe's assets, skills and energy of its people, innovative potential of its business, huge scope for getting more out of the single market. Without this reform, we will not stand still. We will go backwards, and we will risk losing many of the benefits which we have gained over the last 60 years. Of course, growth requires confidence. Confidence is generated by stability. Stability first and foremost in public finance. Building a European economy which delivers sustainable growth requires renewal from the foundations up. Our aim in dealing with financial crisis has always been to put these foundations in place. So far, we have made some progress. Just recently, securing a second package for Greece putting in place an improved system of economic governance for Europe and agreement on the new fiscal treaty. Yet we are not at the end of the process of fiscal consolidation. The hard and difficult work in our member states will have to continue. However, we are now entering a phase where the primary focus of our attention can and must turn towards growth. I repeat, sustainable growth, because there are some kinds of growth that, as we have seen in the past, are really not helpful. This does not mean that nothing has been done until now. Far from it, as you so kindly reminded. And since the beginning of my first mandate in the Commission, I put at the core of our agenda precisely all the reforms and the idea for growth and jobs. And that was the idea also behind launching the Europe 2020 strategy. But the reality is that in the past, collectively, and we have to assume this very honestly, the member states, key stakeholders, and also the European institutions, collectively, we could not collectively deliver. This is the reality. It is for this reason, building on the lessons learned that the Commission proposed and the member states adopted in 2010, Europe 2020 agenda, our agenda for long-term growth and jobs. Since then, the European Commission member states have been working to deliver it. Here I appreciate the focus which the recent letter from 12 heads of state and government placed on some of the actions that we must all undertake. Indeed, Europe 2020 is built mainly on three pillars. The first 
is the reinforced economic governance I've already described. I'm not going now in detail on it. Second, our seven flagship actions in areas essential for smart, sustainable, inclusive growth. And the third is the modernization of the European Union's policy tools. We have a vast range at our disposal, for example. For example, the internal market, our external policies, and the budget. We must maximize their effectiveness. The time has come not to yet again discuss our agenda, but to deliver on our agenda. Our priority is therefore to build on and intensify the work which has been carried out to date. The Commission has presented all seven flagship initiatives and we have asked the Council and the European Parliament to fast track the adoption of key growth boosting proposals. Adopting legislation is one important step in the process, but it is only through implementation that Europeans will feel the benefits of these policies. Here too we are making headway a quarter of the actions on the digital agenda have been completed. Elsewhere, our Youth at Work program is helping young people find employment in SMEs. In addition, we are pressing member states to deliver the actions that fall under their competences to build on the progress made and to meet the targets collectively set. The member states must look at what can be done at national level to promote short-term growth. Actions such as extending the retirement, retirement age, looking at new at regulations, and seeking to open up previously closed sectors are being undertaken in some states and are possibilities others should explore. In a few short months, we'll mark the 20th anniversary of the single market, 20 years on, and despite all the benefit it brings, the single market is still not delivering all it can do in terms of growth. Our member states have given their political support to the single market act we presented last April, we now count on the rapid adoption of the proposals. Our internal market is the largest in the world by value, but we must not neglect our external markets. Trade and investment are important tools for maintaining and enhancing our competitiveness and promoting growth and jobs. In India and China that I visited just recently, I was not simply struck by the economic dynamism that uh, of course we are all aware but by the desire of the business communities to deepen economic ties with Europe. To give some examples, with over 50% of China's population living in urban areas, we agree that the European Union China Summit on a china eu partnership on urbanization to promote exchanges and cooperation in sustainable urban development. With India, we are ever closer to completion of free trade area negotiations, which could generate 18 billion euro in new trade a year. Elsewhere, we are already benefiting. The free trade agreement with Korea entered into force on the 1st July last year and could create over 19 billion euro of new trade in goods and services for the European Union. Investment is always a powerful tool. We must seek to maximize the impact on growth and jobs of the European Union budget and of our direct investment in Europe's future. In the short term, we have increased the European Union's co-financing program countries, making it easier for them to benefit from our funds. And this is already helping support SMEs and job creation. In the longer term, our proposals for the next multi-annual financial framework are all about making the EU budget a budget for long-term growth and jobs. If we agree with the flagship initiatives of the Europe 2020 agenda, if we believe in the single market and see the benefits to our economy of our external policies, then we must see that these policies are adequately funded. We also need, and we have to be clear about this, some investment at European level. All of us agree on the need for growth. The question is, where will growth come from? And growth can come, of course, from the deepening of the single market, for gaining more markets abroad, from our reform for more flexibility in terms of our systems, from labor to pensions to uh, uh, some regulated, too much regulated professions or sectors. But we also need some kind of investment. And since there is no fiscal space in most of our member states, it is obvious that we need to use the leverage of the European structural funds and working also innovatively with our governments and, why not, with the private sector. 
This is the heart of discussion on the multi-annual financial framework, and I welcome the efforts of the Danish presidency to make speedy progress in the negotiations. Indeed, I welcome the support that we have been now receiving to an idea that I've put forward very recently, the idea of project bonds. It means bonds for growth that we can launch even in a pilot phase before the next multi-financial framework so that we can show in a very practical and concrete way that we mean business when we speak about growth. That is not just about statements, but we are ready to put some money there to finance what we need. I mean interconnections in Europe from the energy, for instance, in renewables, to transport, to the digital agenda. Multi-annual financial framework is for the future. Now we need to deliver on these pilot project bonds. This will help further stimulate investment in infrastructure at European level, investment to make connecting Europe a reality, investment that makes sense when a euro at European level makes more sense than an euro spent at national level because precisely we are addressing the issue of the missing links in our European space. We are fully confident that such investment will bring jobs and stimulate growth in the short term and help lay the basis for long, sustainable growth. Distinguished guests, dear friends, later this week we have the Spring European Council. It's an important moment in our cycle of economic governance as we'll discuss in detail national guidance arising from the annual growth survey. This in turn acts as the basis from which the member states will, in April, present national reform programs. This will be complemented in May by the Commission presenting country-specific proposals. The June European Council will take decisions based on these recommendations. I have said that now is the time for delivery, and step by step, this is a process which is delivering. Of course, we need to install a much more acute sense of momentum on these reforms. We are, for instance, delivering on youth unemployment. As a first step, we have identified eight countries where youth unemployment is exceptionally high. In these countries, we are bringing together action teams of commission experts with the national authorities to develop a coherent national and community level approach to meet this challenge. So I will already um, inform the European Council about our preliminary uh, analysis of the efforts made in those eight countries that are facing unsustainable levels of youth unemployment. Second, we are cutting red tape, which hinders small and micro enterprises. Last week, the Council adopted a directive which will significantly reduce administrative bureaucracy for the smallest companies by exempting micro enterprises from the publication of annual accounts. And I've decided to prolong for more two years the smart regulation program, uh, including uh, with a new focus or a more concrete focus on SMEs and micro enterprises and also to address some of the bottlenecks in our public administrations. So we have set our course. We need now to take the next steps along it. However, following still my recent visit to China, I'm reminded of an old Chinese proverb that every explorer should bear in mind, and I quote, only he that travels the road knows where the holes are deep. And there are, I can tell you, many deep holes in our travel. Bearing this in mind, I'm thankful for the support of the Lisbon Council, of uh, many of the experts assembled here and the far greater network of experts across uh, member states. You have been able, in many cases, to give early warning as to how deep the holes are and how best to cross them. For this reason, I'm certain that today's discussion will not simply be fascinating and stimulating, but will also help eliminate our path. I thank you for your attention. I'm now looking forward to your comments and your questions. Thank you very much.